Intel's upcoming Alder Lake CPUs, their 12th gen lineup, is set to take a pretty big leap forward. One that could very well rock the industry and may push its main competitor, AMD, to follow suit. No, I'm not talking about Intel finally moving off of their now very tired 40 nanometer and an endless string of pluses node. No, I'm talking about Intel hybrid technologies. This is a pretty big deal. These new chips are going to have two different types of cores on board from two very different microarchitectures. You'll get up to eight performance cores and up to eight efficiency cores with a total of up to 24 threads and up to 30 megabytes of cache. Now, I can already hear you angrily typing away at your keyboard to tell me that this isn't new. Intel themselves have been doing this or have done this before, and not to mention Apple and uh, this little company called Arm. Well, yeah, I, I know I'm getting to that chill. Now, the angry people are actually completely right. This isn't exactly new. Intel only recently killed off their last attempt, a hybrid CPU co uh, codenamed Lakefield, although I wouldn't say that it being a hybrid CPU was the sole reason for its early shelving, but ARM, and therefore Apple, have been doing or designing what they call big little CPUs for literally a decade now. Admittedly, they have since launched uh, a successor called Dynam IQ, where multiple core designs are integrated into a, a single design, but Big Little is still the, the fundamental concept. Now, since ARM is very much the OG here, let me explain why this design can be so beneficial. As the name suggests, you have some combination of big, high power, high performance cores, and some number of little, low energy, low performance cores. This is a really clever combination, as it means that all of the slow, menial background tasks that a device like your phone needs to do, like updating the clock or checking for incoming notifications, or even less, uh, more active tasks, but still on the lower end of processing power, like streaming music from Spotify, all of that can be done using the low power, high efficiency cores. Sure, it's technically slower, but you'll never notice, and they draw a lot less power doing the same tasks as the big cores would, meaning you get better battery life and better thermals. Then you have the big cores. Say you wanna start streaming a video or taking high res HDR pictures or film 4K video, or even just play a mobile game. Well then, those big cores can kick in to run those tasks, and sure, they will draw more power while doing so, but you get much better performance, and they'll only be switched on when, they, when they're needed, since all of the background tasks are being done by the little cores. This is what Intel is doing with their Intel hybrid technologies. Lakefield was a pretty weird design, as it used just four low power cores and just one high power core, which seemingly traded off most of the performance while not gaining all that much in added efficiency, but it did allow them to learn a whole lot and test out a number of other sort of different features and other designs, like using two different process nodes, 22 nanometers and 10 nanometers on the same block of silicon and stacking the cores literally on top of the integrated GPU and memory controller. Now, with Alder Lake, it's meant to be all one process node, what was formerly called Intel 10 nanometer enhanced super thin, but is now the more catchy Intel 7, and it's meant to be all one die, one physical lump of silicon, but this time, you get a much more even split of performance and efficiency cores. It looks like the E cores are neatly in groups of four. So I would expect that most chips will offer at least four E cores and likely at least two or four P or performance cores at a minimum. Those E cores aren't exactly slouches either. As Intel showed in their architecture day, the new Gracemont efficiency cores can offer as much as 40% more performance 
on a single thread compared to a Skylake or 6th generation core while using 40% less power. That is a significant improvement and when compared in multi-threaded with a dual core quad thread Skylake chip to this new four core, four thread E-core chip, the E-core can offer up to 80% more performance and with up to 80% less power. What they're essentially saying there is that in a specific workload and at a given frequency, four of these new E-cores are only about 10% slower than a quad-core hyper-threaded Skylake CPU like the 6700K while drawing nearly 60% less power, at least based on their charts. And that's absolutely incredible. As for the P-core, well, they aren't as quite wholly revolutionary in their design as the E-core, They've got some pretty important architecture differences compared to the backported Cypress Cove cores we saw in the current 11th generation chips. I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, if you want to have, uh, if you want to dive deeper, Andre and Dr. Kutras have an excellent write-up from the Architecture Day on Anantec that I'll link to in the description. If you want to have a read through. To summarize briefly, there are changes across the core, from more instruction decoders, more micro-operations cache, and double the fetch bandwidth in the front end, to an additional ALU, or arithmetic logic unit, uh, new FAD, or floating point addition units, and improved L2 cache usage to decrease the need to read from system memory unnecessarily in the mid and back end. The end result of those changes is a claimed 19% IPC or instruction per clock improvement with spe specific tasks being up to 60% faster than the 11900K, although some do fall short at around 5-10% to slower, but on the whole it looks like a pretty healthy improvement. So the chips themselves should be plenty fast and efficient, but there is one key piece of the puzzle that's currently missing that without it renders any benefits of having these multiple types of cores somewhat irrelevant. It's called the scheduler and at a base level, its function is to take the instructions from the programs running on your computer and split them up into queues for each of the cores. Again, this is uh, missing out or skipping a, a whole load of complexity, but at its base level, that's its kind of main function. The trouble is, generally speaking, the scheduler is dumb. As in, it's not aware of what's going on in the CPU or the CPU's capabilities or its physical layout and design. We saw this become an issue with AMD's Ryzen CPUs, where thanks to their more modular design, where they grouped cores into what they called a CPU complex, or a CCX, and starting with Zen 2, they also introduced chiplet designs using multiple pieces of silicon connected via their Infinity fabric, and those chiplets are, are called CCDs, and what would happen is that the Windows scheduler would assign one instruction to say a core in the first core complex and then it would assign the next instruction from the same program to another core in a completely different complex or even a completely different physical block of silicon. That means that the CPU would process the first instruction and then when it goes to process the next one, if it has to use the result of the first instruction to you know, calculate that second one, it would then have to travel all the way from the other CCX or CCD to get that information, come back and then process it, which takes way, way longer than collecting it from a core that is physically closer and ideally with some shared L3 cache. Since then, Microsoft worked with AMD to create a CCX aware scheduler so that now the Windows scheduler will at least do its best to not split related tasks across the various CCXs and CCDs on the CPU. Unfortunately for Intel, knowing where cores are is a lot easier to deal with than knowing not only where they are, but also what type of core they are, and probably more importantly, 
what type of instruction should be run on each. While I'm sure with enough work, the various OS schedulers could uh, handle this on their own just fine, but Intel, and I'd argue pretty intelligently, decided to take a more proactive approach to help make the switch as seamless as possible. The OS scheduler will uh, still need to add dedicated support for this, this new paradigm, hence the Windows 11 launch, but Intel's new thread director is aiming to make the OS's scheduler's job a fair bit easier. Of course, the basic idea is that priority tasks, for example, running a game or a 3D render, should be sent to a P core, whereas a background task like run the OS, data fetching, or even I would imagine some amount of web browsing and word processing tasks, they should all be sent to the E cores instead. But on top of that, it's going to be able to move tasks from P to E cores and vice versa, and intelligently manage not just on an application level, but even on an instruction level where tasks get sent. Does your game have a, a thread sleep call? Well, cool, you can have that get busy on an e-core, wasting as little power as possible while it's literally doing nothing, but then when it's done, it can kick back to an, a p-core to compute whatever's next. It will be monitoring the balance and providing feedback to the operating system scheduler to help optimize the, the allocation mix to each core type, and it's meant to even adapt to uh, other settings based on, say, thermals, power settings, and other operating conditions as well. That should mean that the OS will have a, an easier time picking the right cores at the right time and should make for a pretty decent user experience, at least in theory, out of the box. So when you tie that in with the apparently pretty impressive cores, you get a rather revolutionary 4x86 CPU design. Now, you might be thinking, well, I don't care about efficiency. I mean, for a desktop CPU, does it matter that the, the big cores uh, Ryzen uses, for example, are being used for background tasks? Well, from a, a total power draw perspective, no, not really. But from a package power perspective, well, actually, maybe. Take Rocket Lake's 11900K. This had to drop two cores from the last gen 10900K because its big cores drew so, so much power. In fact, so much that they couldn't handle having the same number of cores as the last generation on board. So assuming that Alder Lake's P cores are a similar level of towering inferno, it actually makes sense to include these lower power E cores to handle those background tasks and output less heat while doing so, meaning that there is more thermal and power budget available to the P cores when you do fire up a game or start editing a video. Obviously, just reducing the power consumption and therefore the thermal outputs is the direct solution to that problem, but as an intermediate step or even one that just allows for more flexibility thanks to having those two different types of designs, well, I'm pretty happy with that. In theory, and I should make it clear that this is a hypothetical, I've not seen them talk about this at all, you could, in theory, reserve some number of E cores, perhaps one or perhaps the whole block of four, to not be allocated any intensive tasks, which would mean that you could be rendering a video or a 3D scene and still have some cores effectively idling so that you can use your PC like normal. Sure, you would trade away some performance, but four Skylake performance cores would be plenty to play lighter games like CSGO or Rocket League while still rendering in the background at pretty much full speed. I think that would be a great option for enthusiasts to have access to. Either way, I'm really excited to see what Alder Lake has to offer. It's a big step change for Intel, finally, and it's a genuine innovation in the x86 market. And based on the, the IPC improvement, I wholly expect the 12th gen chips to trounce Ryzen 5000, potentially in both single-threaded and even in all core workloads, despite having sort of the P and the E cores as their, their 16 core chip. 
Of course, AMD does somewhat still have the, the upper hand, if you like, as Ryzen 5000 will be turning a year old right around the Otter Lake launch, and the seemingly magical Zen 4 looms ever closer, but that's what's so exciting. We have actual competition where each company is going to be leapfrogging each other, pushing for more performance and ideally lower prices. It's great and I'm really excited, but what about you? Are you excited for Intel's Old Lake launch and the, the sort of paradigm shift in how they want to go about doing computing in terms of the different core types? Or would you rather the standard or the more standard conventional method that AMD is still rocking? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. Also, are you excited? Are you, are you more excited for Alder Lake or for, I suppose, Zen 4? Feel free to let me know that in the comments as well. If I've missed anything or, you know, got anything wrong or you want to just add some extra bits, then feel free to leave those in the comments too. And any questions, well, you can leave them as well. If you want to see more videos like this one on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday basis, and hopefully the reviews of the Alder Lake CPUs when they, uh, when they launch, then do hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. If you want to, you know, stay up to date, of course, you can use that. But if you want to support the channel, you can use the button right next to it, which is the new YouTube join button where you get access to our Money Men Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and uh, some access to cool emojis you can use in the comments and on our weekly live streams. Or if you'd prefer to support on Patreon instead, there's a link in the description for that. There will also be links in the description, both for some different CPUs if you're interested. Uh, those will be Amazon affiliate links that will take you to the local Amazon store where you can see pricing when and when you watch this. But also, there'll be other links you can check out for stuff like merch hoodies or t-shirts like this one, or a load of the cool designs I made myself. Or there are even less direct ways like affiliate links or places like Overclock UK if you're buying from there. There's VPN options, Humble Bundle, Streamlabs OBS, and a whole lot of other stuff. So do feel free to check it out. I'll also leave some more videos on the end cards if you want to keep watching. Uh, like I said, if you've got any questions, leave those in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, I'll see you on the next video.